Next guest, well, she was shocked to be diagnosed with Alzheimer's at the age of just 62. Like many of us, she probably considered it to be an older person's disease. To tell us how it has affected her and her family, please welcome Helen Watford Brennan and her son Martin. Hi Helen, how are you? Lovely to see you. Mr. Sam, how are you, Martin? How are you? How are you? How are you? How are you? You're from Tupper Curry, County Sligo. Tupper Curry, yes. Yeah, it's beautiful down there. It's beautiful. Yeah. It's situated right in the middle of the Ox Mountains and it's a better place to live. And you're a very well known family in Tupper Curry. Yeah. Well, I think a little. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The famous Helen Rochford Brennan, yeah. I think everyone knows her from yeah. some point, yeah. She's really involved in the community, I'm sure she'll tell you herself. Yeah. And the Western Commission, you were running that, weren't you? Yeah, yeah I was chair of the Western Development Commission when I was diagnosed. Why did you bring Martin here with you today, first of all? I think, yeah, with the um, illness of Alzheimer's, it's very much a family illness as well. Um, and I think sometimes that's overlooked. Um, when I was diagnosed, it was, um, it was earth shattering. And um, I realized that the most important thing was my family. Um, Martin is uh, my son and my husband, Mar uh, my husband Sean. And um, for us as a family, they had to adjust to me not remembering, to, um, to just simple everyday things in my life that, uh, that I just couldn't uh, read the paper. I couldn't remember what was in the paper and Sean used to say to me, well, you read the paper, Helen. And I say, mm. yeah, but I don't remember that. Or I told Martin something or Martin told me something and I just didn't remember it. And I realized that it's just not an illness about me, it's just an illness about, for the whole family. So that's why it was reassuring and comforting too to have him here with me. Yeah, that's great. Did you notice, what did you notice first in terms of changes yourself, Helen? Like you were very busy, you were always active, I'm told. So what were the things? It's not just about not remembering things, sure it isn't. Well, I think that's the myth about the illness is that mm. you feel it's, um, I've always heard that it was about memory, but really it's your intellectual ability to do your, to do your job, to carry out your chores and your home or, or, or whatever you're involved in. And, I, and that's what for me how I realised that there was something wrong because um, I was at work, I, I worked for the Irish Wheelchair Association and uh, I realised that I had the entry here and I couldn't get, it was so basic, I couldn't get the entry in the middle of the desk or off the desk and that was how I felt. I just, um, it, was, it, it, it was really difficult to try and understand why I just didn't get, couldn't get through my work. And, uh, the more I tried, the more I just got so, then you get anxious, you get frustrated. Um, and I used to think, well, is it my memory or isn't? And I had a head injury in the past and I, I, I knew all the strategies to use and none of them were working. So, um, so in the end, I, I, I went to a doctor um, and I, you know, over a period of time, I realized there was something fundamentally wrong with me. And eventually, you know, I, I did get a diagnosis of early onset Alzheimer's and from then, it, it, was, it had a huge impact on our lives, you know, it had a huge impact on, 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 on my own life because all of a sudden you have major fear. And I suppose the record today, um, Alzheimer's is uh, like cancer was 20 years ago. You know, when somebody yeah. was told that cancer, well, it's the same today for Alzheimer's. We, you know, it's shock, it's fear, it's the unknown. Um, I think at the, <laughs> at the time of diagnosis, I was involved in something like 10 organizations. Um, and uh, I was working, I was running a home, you know, it was <laughs> all of those things. And all of a sudden, but you don't feel like, um, you feel like you're in a bubble and there's just a huge numbness in your life. You know, it's, your head is fuzzy um, and you want to think of the future. And really, in some ways, you don't think of the future. Martin, in terms of the effect on you and your dad, Sean, who's here as well tonight, mm. how, did, how did you feel when you first heard? Well, we heard it a few months before Christmas and it was, it was definitely a dark, um, a dark period. It was certainly hard to adjust to the news. Um, kind of the main feeling for the both of us has been a feeling of helplessness because we didn't know how to support her. We, we tried to support her as much as we could and we tried to emphasise, you know, um, what, what she could do to try and, you know, we, we looked up on the internet, we did things like that. We tried to find out what we could do to, to try and um, help things and to try and improve things. But uh, it's certainly hard to adjust. And um, I think 
the one, the one, I suppose, clear thought that I can bring from it is that it's best to talk through things. Um, sometimes it was difficult to talk to mom or dad about it because it's an upsetting conversation to have and tears are going to roll and things like that are going to happen. But I think the support of friends has certainly brought me through once, once I kind of talked to my friends about it and they kind of, uh, you realise that everyone else has problems too and it's just a case of talking through it and it kind of certainly helps to keep your, keep your emotions in check and kind of realise that it's better to focus on what we can do to make the most of our time and what we can do to move forward. So. Initially, did you find it difficult to tell people yourself home? I found it um, extremely difficult. I honestly didn't know what to say because there's a huge stigma around the illness and yeah. I think that people look at it long, uh, long ago, a serious mental illness, and where when you have early onset, it's just that your memory is just a little diminished and the rest of you is the same and people don't know how to talk to you and that's one of the hardest things for me yeah. to deal with is that you know it's easier to walk across the street and not say how are you Helen you know how are things you know they, it just doesn't happen like that and um, and I just want people to know that I you know I am the same person um, yeah. yeah albeit I might not remember their name or I may not remember you know where I met them or whatever and so so therefore it was easier it took a while for me to think about about telling it and I have um, I just want to remember my late friend Maeve Walsh and I used to say to Maeve, Maeve was um, very ill at the time and I used to say to Maeve oh god Maeve you know my memory is really bad I can't remember it. we may be talking about something that happened in the chamber or whatever and she Maeve used to say to me oh for god's sake Helen you know we all have the same problem <laughs> so we ended up falling about laughing about this illness that uh, I thought I had and Maeve thought everybody had it so. <laughs> Um, and from there I, I realised that I really had to do something and I was at my doctor and my doctor said to me, you know, you should really go to the Alzheimer's Society and see if they can help you uh, because it seems a bit wasted that you're, you're, not, you're not doing anything and, and so that's how I began to tell people. I went to the Alzheimer's um, uh, in, in Ballandine and Mayo and they said to me, why don't you get involved with research? You know, mm. that, you can do something, it's about learning. You can learn something new and that's what will help you through this. And, and so I did get in touch with um, Trinity College Dublin through a good um, a friend, um, Nurse Anne Coffey, had heard Dr Ian Robinson on the radio. Mm. And um, she came to my house and she gave me his name and number and Martin gave me a good push along with his dad and then I had to write to him straight away, <laughs> which I did and he responded straight away and that's how I got involved with Alzheimer's and that's where it brought me to telling people and um, I, I did start to tell and it was really emotional for me to tell so I started off where I knew best, I'm very involved with a, a campaign in the west of Ireland called West on Track where we were trying to open the railway line from Derry to Cork so <laughs> I thought well I'll start off with two two guys I know well, I know well, Martin and Coleman, and I went to Glamaris and I said, I want to meet you for a cup of coffee. So I'm sure they were wondering, had I some big news from Leo Radker or something? <laughs> so, uh, I met them and I told them, and it was really emotional. I mean, oh. and, and then, you know, they were emotional, I was emotional. And, you know, uh, I thought, I, for, for a moment, I thought, how am I going to get through this? And, and then it was like, well, you know, Helen, uh, we have, uh, you know, we, we have uh, five of the largest cities in, in in the island of Ireland connected to the Western Arc and, and we need the sixth and you know we, we, we need to see about getting this, this done straight away and <laughs> like, right. okay we, so need, they to forgot move, about we need to move on straight away and, yeah. um, and you know you will always be with us. I thought the nicest things they said to me was you know, no matter what we do or wherever we go you know, we will always bring you with us no matter how your illness progresses you know That's and so that was lovely, really actually. helpful so from there I just started to tell other people I told I had told my, my, my best friend in Chicago, Aggie, and, my, and her sister, Nuala, in London, and um, my dear friend that lives near me, Margaret. And, um, and that was all I told other than my family. And I'm one of a big family, so I have loads of uh, relatives and cousins. That's and great. So I was just good to be able to talk to them. But I think it doesn't, I hope it doesn't have any impact on their lives every day. I think in your immediate family it has more of an impact and it's good to talk about it. I've yeah. discovered now that with the help of the lads that has been really good for me to talk about and I'd like to, you know, advocate for this illness that it isn't the end of the world where a year ago I would have thought it was. Well look, I think it's just been so important that you've done that and that you've come here tonight and told us your story. Um, thank you so much, Martin and Helen. Thank you for coming here tonight.
Here's a quick reminder of tonight's competition. You could win a VIP shopping weekend here in Dublin, staying in a luxurious balcony suite overlooking the beautiful gardens at the five-star Radisson Blue St. Helens Hotel. You'll enjoy breakfast each morning and be treated to dinner in the hotel's authentic Italian restaurant. Yeah, welcome to Up For The Match. We're on the edge of history. Tomorrow, Kilkenny going to become the first team ever in hurling our football to win five in a row. <laughs> well, it seems to me that no one would like stopping them more than Tip, am I right? Yeah. Well, whatever, I have to tell you, things are changing in the hurling world. Tonight on Up For The Match, we have, for the first time ever, a pair of leather trousers and rap singing, so it's going to be very different. Where, where are they? No. I'm not wearing them, in fairness. Are they in the cleaners? In, fa in fairness to our audience, they're a bit tight tonight. <laughs> but look, it's a great crowd in. Grainne and I really looking forward to having a bit of fun before the final. I know not everyone here would agree, but it's not life or death, it's, it's a more, party. It's more yeah. important than that, Des. It is to some of them. We'll yeah. enjoy it. Indeed. We are going to get the party started now by testing the vocal talent of you guys here tonight. Let's have a straight competition to see which county has the better singers in the audience. So, <laughs> leading the TIP fans, Louise Morrissey, and representing the Kilkenny fans from the All-Ireland Talent Show, it's Nafina's Ross Hennessy. <laughs> Very well to you, my tiny half. A thousand times a Jew. We are going away from the holy ground and the girls we all love through. We will sail the salt seas over and we'll return for sure to see again the girls we love. The holy ground once more. My girl, my girl, I do adore and still I live. The whole ground once more Boy, girl, you are Well, there wouldn't be a sailor man A sailor man to pay To win the good will of his captain's good name He came ashore while well, he'd been hard to be And that was the beginning of the end To love me and the tomboy's home Oh, my day to be We taste to roll by the shore sunny stream And to hear the dogs coo Neat the morning sun here Where the trash and the robin Their sweet doves entwine On the pines of the shore That flows down by moon point Flow on lovely river no gently along by your water so clear Sounds a lark's merry song On your green banks I'll wander Where first I eat a join With you, lovely Molly The rose of Bill Coy It flies far away by night and by day to the times and the joys that are gone. But I never will forget 
the sweet maid and I met where in the valley of steam I See the way they came together in the end in harmony. What a beautiful thing. Hands across the divide. Which county has the best singers? I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I think the tip crowd are hungry tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Look, at, you're all privileged here in the audience for one reason. You're going to be the first people to see the Liam McCarthy Cup all polished and shiny ahead of tomorrow. Now, for those of you who are from Tipperary who don't know what the Liam McCarthy Cup is, it's the one that Kilkenny <laughs> owned. Okay, that's what that is. <laughs> Well, they've had it from lo on loan for a while anyway. We have a very special person to bring it out this evening. Yeah, he's a world record holder. I think he's the ultimate representative of all that is great about the GA. I'm sure all of you will share my view. Let me tell you about his extraordinary record. He is commentating this year for the eighth decade. Commentating on national radio for eight decades. It's unbelievable. His first commentary was as a young fella in 1949, so in the 40s, the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, the noughties, and now the start of this. His eighth decade of national record worldwide cannot be beaten. The one, the only, Mihal Omarajarte. <laughs> And this is it? That's it, yeah. Did you arrive on the bike? All set and shine. <laughs> on Shanksmere. Shanksmere. <laughs> but you're looking well on it. Yeah, the cup is looking well. Yeah. You're not looking so and bad that's yourself. Liam really. McCarthy ever ado. First one away back to 1921. It's gone everywhere. And where is this going to be tomorrow? Or will we wait a while? I'll, I'll, I'll tell you later. I'm right. still <laughs> brooding over the whole right. thing. <laughs> it mightn't go anywhere. We hadn't a draw since 1959. Oh, don't say it. You never know, Niva Kusuk. Niva Kusuk. Miel, do you still look forward to the matches as much as you do as, as, as we heard earlier? Since 1949, you've been, you've been commentating on, on very, very big matches. Is each one of them as exciting as the one that went before? Well, I think the whole country looks forward to them. When the season starts, what are people talking about it? Wouldn't it be great to be playing in September? Yeah. September is here. They're still playing. 17 and a half hours to go. And the yeah. slither is thrown in. The referee will get out of the way. And the greatest game that was ever seen will be seen tomorrow, I think. And My I'm, nerves, can you feel it when he starts talking about the build-up? Do you know who else will be nervous watching, and it's only, what, 15 and a half hours, the miners of Clare yeah. and uh, yeah. uh, Kilkenny, so we want to wish them Absolutely. well as well. Exactly. Yeah. Absolutely. All that man has to do is avail Uskilch and the nerves start already. We have a great competition for you at home now. We've teamed up with Centra, a proud sponsor of the GAA Hurling Championship, to give you the chance to win a VIP trip for two to tomorrow's final. You'll be collected tomorrow by our limo from wherever you are in the country, brought to Croke Park, where you'll receive tickets for the big game and soak up all the action live. Plus, there's an overnight stay in the four-star Croke Park Hotel in Dublin, a thousand euro spending money and the very important limo ride home on Monday as well. That's all thanks to Centra. So for your chance to win the holiday and the cash, answer this. Tipperary is also known as what county? Is it the Premier County, the Champion County or the Rebel County? If you think you know the answer, call 1515 71 22 33 or text the word MATCH followed by your answer and your name to 57111. Viewers in Northern Ireland can also text to 57111 or call the number on screen. You must be over 18 to enter. Full details are on RT Airtel, page 194. The lines close at 11 tonight. The lucky winner will be announced towards the end of the show. Now, before we meet our first panel, let's remind ourselves how Kilkenny and Tip reached the final. It's now covered. This is gold written all over it, and it is. Sam Corbett is inside again. Hits it! Looking 
for six in a row in the next year. Kilkenny are the Leicester Hurling champions once again. Just listen to the roar. Crumb Park, ready for action. Henry Shefflin coming forward to release to Brennan. A cracking goal by Eddie Brennan. The ball gets lost. Bogan is in after it, and it's in the back of the net. And Kilkenny have simply romped past Cork in the All-Ireland semi-final. Please welcome our first panel tonight. All Ireland medal winners, all of them. Kilkenny's Liam Fennelly, and from Tipperary, Joe Hayes and Connell Bonner. Hi, Connell, how are you? Hi, Joe. Liam, you're very welcome. Thank you. Joe. Now, Connell, <coughs> in the interests of fair play and Freedom of Information Act and all the rest of it, I need to clear this up. First of all, is it true that you have slept in the same bed as Des Cahill? Yeah, it's amazing what a fellow would do to get on telly. They're not even shocked, which is the worst thing. No, they, they don't realise I was in it at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know, in fairness, it was a long time ago, but... Uh, he uh, lost the toss, basically. <laughs> but uh, um, Des's career has blossomed since. <laughs> it, it, it would have been OK. What happened, Liam, was there was, there was four of us away, Connell, his brother Colm, Mm -hmm. Nicky English and Nicky's father, Donny. Donny got a room, we got a room with three beds, and they argued over who'd share with Desi. And it would have been grand, but Ian Dempsey rang on 2FM the next morning, and I said, I'm in bed with one of the Tipperary hurlers, but it was live on the radio. <laughs> <laughs> So my kids had to go into school with teachers extremely concerned about what their father was asking. <laughs> was, the was the expertise proper? And no, it, the was, it, was, I, it was young and I've matured a lot since then. But <laughs> it's, every time I see him, it's just what I think of. <laughs> anyway, that's clear. Moving on. Yeah, yeah, I'm glad we cleared that up. Joe, is this rivalry serious between Kilkenny and Tipperary? I'm not going to ask you whether you slept with Des, by the way. No. <laughs> I don't want to hear an answer to no, that. No, no, no. Is this I, rivalry I, serious? I didn't, I didn't. Um, <laughs> I oh, swear you, you, I didn't. You deny me now, Joe. <laughs> I promise I didn't. He's a fine looking man, though, isn't he? <laughs> <laughs> uh, not bad at all. Uh, I was just looking, actually, the cup, it's looking splendid, and fair play to me, Hall, for bringing it out. It's looking splendidly it in love. It's like yourself, Gron. It's polished up to the last Shining. 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 And a smile on its face, and why wouldn't it be? It's going home tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> But Four Joe, years is a long time inside. <laughs> <laughs> it's coming out. It's coming, going home, going home to the home of Harland. The Kilkenny lads don't like that. <laughs> they hate to hear us saying it's the home of Harland, but we don't mean it in the sense that we're the best. But I suppose it was, it was born and ra raised in Hayes' Hotel in Torless, and it's a tremendous uh, <laughs> tradition there. Right. So hopefully things will go well. Granny, it's only like yesterday since we were on talking about last year's final. <laughs> and it didn't go well for us. Didn't. <laughs> no. No. But Liam, is, is this true now? Uh, are Tip Kilkenny's biggest rivals? Yeah, they are because we're on the border. Yeah. And uh, over the years, I suppose, they've beaten us in nine All-Irelands and we've only beaten them in, in, in five. So they haven't played that often, actually. Apart from that, uh, they met I think four times in semi-finals and uh, Tip only lost 10 all Ireland. they won 24, so that's the problem. They don't like losing, and, uh, but they better get used to it. <laughs> <laughs> the danger is they are getting used to it now. But are you nervous about tomorrow, Liam? 
Yeah, I'm nervous. I probably was more nervous last year because uh, the players were more nervous as well because the pressure of winning four in a row and without beating Tiberi and winning that All Ireland, they wouldn't have been remembered for what they are because they're an absolutely super team. Mm. And to complete that, they definitely had to beat uh, the Premier County, and uh, they did it in a heck of a game and a memorable game, and we'll never forget it. Well, when you talk about that rivalry, and Fan Larkin is in the audience, he'll be joining us here later. But Fan, back in the 60s, you won what in 67? That was the first time Kilkenny had beaten Tip in decades, wasn't Since it? Since 1922. So it must have been fierce. It was fierce rivalry, yeah. But yeah. as Liam says, we didn't meet that often. Yeah. You know, Tipper had an upper hand. But we're closing the gap. After tomorrow, <laughs> there'll be only three between us. <laughs> <laughs> Are you confident about tomorrow? Very confident, Des. Oh, yeah. Very confident. Does that worry you, Joe, when he's confident? Not one bit. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, we, play, we, we bet often enough, which he can't remember the ones we bet you. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, like, 37, uh, 37, 50, 45, and uh, 64. Oh, he did the homework all right. Yeah. He knows everything about her. Yeah. 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 They were the years. And of course, back then, there was a whole family tradition. Your father played. Yeah, my father yeah. played in 37. Yeah. And I played in... 64 and 71. Philly is the only one lucky enough to have bet tip in the semi-final. Come on, Philly. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, it's a, it's a fair old record. And, Conor, for you, you played against Kikini in 91. You were all involved in 91, mm -hmm. actually. Yeah. Uh, what did that mean? Um, it was a fantastic for Tipperary, obviously. Like, we won in 89 and a lot of people didn't give us credit for it, you know, and we were beaten then the following year against Cork. So, it was fantastic to come back and to beat Cork and then to beat Kilkenny in the final. And, you know, it was two out of three years for us at that stage. So it was, it was more of a huge relief than a celebration, you know. Uh, it was great to have it done. And we didn't play it particularly well in the final, but uh, thankfully the backs brought us, brought us over the line. <laughs> How many Bonners played? Three, wasn't it? Three. Colin How many and Fenley, Fenley's played? I was just that day. 87, there were four of us and we lost to, to Galway. So disappointing day, but that's, uh, that's the sport. To be honest, uh, you have to win some, you have to lose some, and that's what makes the sport so good. And what makes it great all together is that you, we all can sit down together afterwards and have a few pints and a bit of chat. And hurling people in general can do that. Probably mm. more than footballers, because we, when we went away on All Star Tours, the hurlers really clicked and we all got on well together and we all done queer things. <laughs> <laughs> when you mentioned 91, the, the, the only goal scorer is there in front of us, and Michael Cleary, who got the goal uh, for Tip, the crucial goal. And I'll ask you about it, Michael, but for our younger viewers, we'll remind them of the goal that won the match for Tip that day. That's what's known as a muted round of applause. There was one Kilkenny pair of hands met there. <laughs> Michael, you weren't going for the top corner, were you? Of course was. <laughs> as the Archbishop said the night after, Des, he went for a pint and had to be happy with a goal. <laughs> <laughs> and it was crucial, though, wasn't it? I mean, that was... Ah, I suppose it was, yeah. I, I, yeah. Probably, in hindsight, you'd look at the replay of the match and you'd say... As Colin says, the Becks and Pat Fox won that match for us, but we, did, we didn't mind. We didn't mind, yeah. you know, so. It was a yeah, very memorable occasion. Yeah. Just wanted to tell, I was telling Fan early on that uh -huh. we're starting our drive for five tomorrow, so we just went to <laughs> Kilkenny. <laughs> just in case he didn't realise uh, that. Yeah. Liam, Micheál mentioned it when, when he came on there with the trophy. This is Liam McCarthy, Mark II, and you're the man who's lifted both of them, the first Liam and the second Liam. Yeah, I was lucky. Uh, I was playing with the Sharmucks and uh, to win the, to be captain you had to, to, to win your own championship and in 83 I was a young man after Brian captain, Cody captain in 82 and mm. uh, I got the honour in 83 with bet the village in the final, fan in that right? Oh, oh, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then in 91 uh, Paul Phelan was playing and he, he didn't make it for the all Ireland and uh, the all Ireland mm. finals and uh, I took over as captain. And, uh, and of course was. when you mentioned Ballyhale, Kevin Fenley's in the audience and Kevin the, the Ballyhale record was extraordinary. Four of you played in the All-Ireland Club final. How many Fenleys played in Ballyhale winning an All-Ireland Club title? Uh, seven of us played in the, in the last two. Uh, That's days. incredible. That really is seven yeah, brothers yeah, yeah. in an All-Ireland Club team. And Dermot came in as sub on the first one, so the seven of us finished up on the first. So yeah. we were lucky enough to have a, a, 
uh, good team with us and the lads. We, there, were, there were 97 friendlies like those there, there was 20 other fellas there equally as good as we were and yeah. we, were, we were just lucky and, uh, and we're still lucky actually at death. Like I mean, they talk about the home of Hurland. i tell you about the home of Hurland is you look at the records. <laughs> 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 Uh, security for Joe Hayes, please. <laughs> <laughs> Liam Shefflin comes from the same uh, Henry, club yeah. as yourselves. Yeah, yeah. They're calling him the king. You, obviously, you've seen an awful lot of talent coming from that small village and that small mm -hmm. club. Is he the best for you? Oh, he's the best. He's the best. Uh, his skill level and his, apart from his skill level, uh, which is absolutely superb, it's his overall effort on the field of play. It's his, the overall package. He just, uh, he's a leader. Uh, he does all the right things, he brings all the players along with him, and uh, there is no doubt about it, there is no one ever been better than him. Even you'd have to give credit there, Joe, wouldn't you? Well, definitely, they don't call him the king for nothing. He's a tremendous hurler, and we, everyone in Tipperary wants to see him playing tomorrow. We want to beat a full Kilkenny team, not a, <laughs> not a half Kilkenny team. And, you know, most people aren't giving Tip a chance tomorrow, but we have our own little princes too, and we have Owen Kelly, a tremendous full forward. Owen Kelly is as good as hurlers as I have seen, you know. Uh, I told Nicky English actually today he was the best since Jimmy Dial. He didn't take it too well. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, do you know, we're going up tomorrow. I can't understand it because, you know, uh, we, we nearly won that match last year. Mm. We were unfortunate. Benny Dunn was unfortunate. Mm. And uh, up to that point, there was nothing in it. Uh, the goal from the free or the penalty or whatever it was, it was a goal and Henry would have got it. And I, I was upset at the time about it. And I remember meeting Michal at a golf out in, in Wicklow. And I said, Michal, it wasn't a, 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 a penalty. Joe, it didn't matter whether it was a penalty or not. He would have stuck it in the back of the net. And you know what? You, you gave me a lot of uh, release that day. <laughs> <laughs> that was the day I accepted that Kilkenny were all Ireland <laughs> and All we can do is tomorrow is to come back and try and get this crown off him and try and bring this cup back up to a simple stadium on Monday night. And if we're, if we're bet on Sunday, that is tomorrow, we'll find another excuse. <laughs> Well, the Kilkenny men here might be playing down the drive for five and the hype. What do they really feel? Well, Liam Fennelly's daughter, Leanne, who's in our audience tonight. Hi, Leanne. Is a Kilkenny Camogie star herself. And we asked her to get the inside line for us. Benji! Yes, ma'am. What are you knocking yourself up for? I just thought you were supposed to be going into Kilkenny. Yes, I am. 